Good afternoon. Welcome back to a special edition of the BNH virtual event space. Yes, today we have our expert panel here and we're talking about the hot new release, the Canon EOS R3. Uh, I want to send a thank you, first of all, before we get started to everybody joining us on Facebook live stream and YouTube and welcome you to get your questions in. We are going to be doing some Q&A throughout. So if you have a question, don't wait until the end. Throw it in whenever you see fit. And uh, that being said, I want to welcome our panel of guests here. We have uh, Keith Lazinski, Jake Estes, and Rudy Winston joining us. First of all, Keith is a Canon Explorer of Light. He is a Nat Geo photographer, Emmy-nominated director. He is shot for pretty much everybody under the sun. He's got a bunch of cool stuff stories, just some phenomenal pictures. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out his release video for the R3, please do. I promise you, see my hair standing up. If you're a parent, you may want to take some caution while watching this. It's a tearjerker. Um, alongside him, we have senior producer here on the video team for B&H, Jake Estes, who did a video on the R3 as well. Although Keith got to work with African wildlife and Jake was stuck with me modeling for him. So little bit different, but nonetheless, some great information there. And as always, the man of the hour. He is more calming than a cup of chamomile tea. He's more knowledgeable than the Encyclopedia Britannica's my generation grew up with. Canon's own Rudy Winston over two decades with Canon. So he's going to be bringing us back to all the specs. But I want to welcome all you guys. Keith, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about you. Uh, hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you. I'm Keith Lodzinski, coming in from Boulder, Colorado right now. And uh, this was an incredibly exciting project to be a part of. This was definitely a highly anticipated camera. And when Canon reached out, you know, I was gushing, and especially when they told me the specs. Uh, wildlife's a big part of what I do. And this camera was just the perfect tool to go out and shoot wildlife. And I, I can't wait to talk more about it. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to hear about a, some stories from the road. Jake, you got your hands on this early, you got to take it out for a spin. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your first experience with the camera. Sure. Yeah, I'm a senior video producer uh, for the BNH YouTube channel. I've been doing that for a little over four years now. Uh, I've reviewed quite a few cameras in my time. And I must say uh, the Canon EOS R3 is like the fastest camera I think I've ever shot with. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's powerful and fast. Yeah, you, you, there's a few moments in the video where you just sort of see my natural reaction to the burst rate. It's pretty insane. And that was definitely not hammed up for the camera. I was there live, and I can't tell you how. No, many that times was a just authenticity, genuine that authenticity. Was. Yeah, yeah. Jake, Jake, I think passed around the camera probably about fifty times during the shoot to show us. Like, oh my god, look at this. Uh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Jake. Rudy, take us home. Tell us a little bit about you. I'm Rudy Winston. I'm a technical advisor at Canon USA. And really, I've been with Canon for a long time. But even though the world, I'm not trying to get sober here, but even though the world has gone through a really challenging at best period over the last year and a half, uh, this has been from the Canon perspective, an incredible time in terms of the gear that we are putting out and the evolution of the R system with the R5 and the R6 and some of the lenses that were launched in 2020. And now in 2021, the, the beat goes on. And this camera, uh, I think as people start to get the R3 in their hands, they're gonna realize just the incredible power that this camera has. And believe me, it goes way beyond its ability to shoot 30 frames a second. Now, I want to remind everybody, if you just joined us, we are talking about the new Canon EOS R3, and we are welcoming all questions, so don't hesitate to get those in. But Rudy, let's let's take it right back there. I mean, I want you to talk a little bit to start about this last year and what you guys have seen in the evolution of the, the R line and where it takes us to this release today. Well, you, you have to, I won't go all the way back in time, but certainly just referencing what I said a moment ago. You look at what the R6 and the R5 brought to such a broad range of photographers who were looking for performance, who were looking for modern capabilities in a full frame mirrorless camera. They opened some tremendous, tremendous doors in terms of high resolution in the case of the R5, in terms of value and performance in terms of the R6. 
uh, the, the focusing systems in those two cameras are outstanding. And the cool thing is, as we'll discuss today, the R3 builds upon that. It's not just the same focusing system. But what the, what the R5 and the R6 did in terms of opening up to so many users, fields like wildlife, birds in flight, things that previous generation Canon cameras really kind of struggled with if you wanted the camera to do the work. Uh, all of a sudden, these are things that you can do. The transition that many of our customers have made from digital SLR, whether it's APS-C, like a 7D series or full frame, like a 5D series, uh, into mirrorless and the things that they've discovered, the ability to focus, you know, way, way, way off center, eye detection and things like that. Uh, it's a whole new ballgame. And again, this camera, as we'll discuss, is just going to put a big excla excla exclamation point, he tried to say on that. Now, what are we looking at as far as advances? I mean, if I, if I had this camera plopped down in front of me, What's the go-to specs? What did you guys update? What's reinvigorated on this camera? What shines above as far as the feature skill set? A couple of things stand out. Number one, the, the full frame stacked back lumid, illuminated, well, I'm having trouble with my words today, <laughs> CMOS sensor totally changes the game in terms of its fast read speeds. And again, this isn't just 30 frames a second, which is remarkable in and of itself, but low distortion. Uh, the fact that we now have, you know, correction for things like flicker and so on at a much higher level than we did before. The autofocus in this camera has to be seen to be believed. And we'll talk about that in detail, but the, the focus, de the subject detection capability, the ability to detect people, animals, and now vehicles, combining that with unprecedented tracking performance, that ability to follow a subject around the frame, not just coming toward the camera or away from it, uh, but to follow it around the frame. We had those in the R5 and the R6, and they were brilliant in those cameras. This just takes us to a totally new level. Those are the things that just absolutely jump out at me when I think about this camera. And yes, it is actually a very solid video camera as well, even though we talk about it as a stills first camera. Interesting. Now, Keith, I want to bring it over to you. You get the fun part out of all this. You get to fly over to Africa. You don't have to dig into the specs. You can kind of just take it. Hey, this is what it's supposed to do. I'm going to go out there and do my thing. So I, I want you to take us into your experience using this camera, compare it to, you know, what you've shot in the past, how this stands in comparison and for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, how you found the R3. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, you know, I, I, I do a, a variety of different types of shooting um, before the R3, the R, the R5 has been like my go-to camera, right? I love that camera. It's small, it's compact. It packs like a serious punch. A lot of megapixels, the video is phenomenal on it. Getting my hands on the R3, I knew that this was the camera that was going to be for specific work. And for me, it will be my wildlife camera for sure. That thing's just going to live in my bag. And one of the first things um, that I was kind of blown away with was when I, when the camera showed up, it's way lighter than you anticipate it being when you pick it up. You know, having worked with the 1DX in the past, you know, picking up the R3, I was just like, wow, this this doesn't feel right. Did they forget to put something inside of this thing? You know, it's like that light pop the battery. And I, I mostly work with the 600 RF, you know, the uh, 600 F4 RF lens, which is also quite light, which when you're shooting birds, it's kind of, I typically go handheld because they're moving quick. You know, you're sitting there at first, you're holding position for a really long time, either hoping for them to take flight or you're spotting them and trying to like whip the camera around and try to grab on and track them as quickly as you can. And, you know, I'm not a big guy and working on a tripod can is, is, is good. I like using a monopod when I can, but I was in the safari truck most of the time, you know, getting out of the truck, it's, it's a dangerous place. There's a lot of animals there that, that, you know, you have to definitely keep your eye out for. And so being able to work with something really light right away, was like a nice advantage, but what blew me away was the performance of the autofocus. I mean, it's not uncommon if a, especially in bird photography, if you track onto something and, you know, following it and just bursting that a lot of those frames are going to go in and out of focus. It's completely normal. The problem is, is when that happens, there could be a key moment within that sort of missed frame. 
I was shocked of the accuracy of this camera and how it just stuck. It was like, I kept saying, I, I kept saying to my, my two friends that were with me, I'm like, this thing is sticky. <laughs> it just keeps locking on. <laughs> and it, 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 even if, you know, birds, other birds were passing or, or there was a tree in the way, as long as I could lock on, you know, the X factor was me trying to keep up with these things because they're fast and unpredictable. So a lot of times, you know, I'd, as soon as the bird would pass, I'd go through and, and review and there'd be one like way up in the corner, you know, because I just wasn't keeping up physically with this thing and it was still tack sharp. And, uh, and the files as well were incredible. You, you could just keep punt, zooming in on that thing. And for me with wildlife, it's all about the eye, right? I mean, that's, I think that's for most people, you know, you, you want the, you want to feel the eye and with these files and coupled with that 600 F4 RF lens, just gorgeous, gorgeous files. You know, it's funny, Keith, I was joking around with the guys in the, in the green room beforehand saying that you're out there shooting a kingfisher, diving into the water. And Jake had to only worry about tracking me running down a sidewalk, which <laughs> I don't think there's much of a comparison there. So but it, it's funny, the same sentiment. I mean, I wasn't joking when I said Jake's passing around the camera. Every single frame was you, you could really had your pick of image and Jake, I, you know, you can expand upon this. Uh, you probably do a better job of it than I will, but it's like, I think we're all used to that shooting something in motion in burst mode and eh, maybe you'll get three out of five, maybe you'll get two out of five. Um, <laughs> every single shot was usable. Yeah. You know, it was like, there's a clip at the end of the video that I put as like kind of a blooper at the end of the video where you hear me off the cuff say, it's like I'm watching a movie in stop motion. So like when I reviewed the photos, it was like, I felt like I was watching a video. Like that's how many frames were in focus and how many frames were like, there was times where I feel like I wasn't even working. I would just put the camera up and I would just hit the shutter and it's the camera's doing all the work. And I'd be like, oh, that was easy. Like I was done. I was like, okay, go do it again. So I can get more variety, go run again. Cause I'm really not working that hard. Like it just speaks to the power and performance of this R3 that really blew me away. Um, and yeah, it was just, I don't know. It's incredibly sticky. And then like, you know, the fun part is like, I kept thinking like, how can I show this in the video? It's like, I'm just going to put all the bursts there. I'm just going to let it run on the timeline. So people understand like, cause you can't look through the viewfinder, you know, at least we couldn't do that. We didn't have the technology to sort of go through the viewfinder and show what the, the tracking is doing. So like the best way to show was just show bursts after bursts to show how in sharp focus you were doing a variety of, of calisthenic activities, which included jumping down a flight of stairs, which was dangerous, but you handled it beautifully. And uh, the camera captured it uh, beautifully as well. And you can just see his, and his, to watch his face react to go from like, <laughs> Oh, like I'm going to, I'm going to hit the pavement. Like to see that in real time when you're going through the images, I mean, I don't, I don't can't think of a better way to express what this camera is capable of, you know? Yeah. If you don't like the faces you make during sports, do not have somebody take your image with this camera. <laughs> this, yeah. This yeah. The and then, and you running too, you know, like the running, the, you know, it was just, it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yes. You, you can all head over to BNH's YouTube channel and see my exasperated faces caught in extremely high definition. Mm -hmm. Now, Rudy, was was this a focus for you guys really taking that autofocus up to the next level? It seems like that's one of the, the key standouts of the R3. Yeah, I, I, I think in general, in the era of full frame mirrorless industry wide, not just Canon, uh, autofocus has been that area where the engineers can really wield a strong hammer. And our engineers uh, really got down to business. Uh, they started with the R5 and the R6. They clearly learned a lot from those because they've taken that and expanded upon it, not just with adding new types of subjects that we can detect with the subject detection system. But the, the biggest thing, and I'll admit that it took me a while to wrap my mind around it when I first read about the feature before I actually had had a chance to put my hands on a pre-production camera. But the thing that truly blew me away is for the first time on a Canon camera, think about this. Ever since the dawn of autofocus, we have sort of been schooled that if you're shooting a moving subject in servo AF or whatever the company calls that continuous AF following a moving subject, that you put a focusing point on that subject. And for a long time, you had to keep a focusing point on that subject, whether you moved the camera or whatever. 
obviously now with modern mirrorless cameras, we have tracking capability where you can start with a point on a subject, identify it for the system, and the system says, okay, I got this. And then if the subject starts moving around the frame, not just, again, not just toward and away from the camera, but moving around the frame, it can do it. The thing that blew me away about this camera is you don't even have to start with a focusing point on the subject. You can have a focusing point, whether it's a single focusing point or any of the available AF areas that we have. You can have a focusing cluster away from the subject, tap the shutter button act or the back button, whichever you prefer to activate autofocus, and immediately subject detection is looking at the entire frame in terms of what's available for AF with a given lens. And if it sees a person, a vehicle, or an animal that it can detect anywhere else in the frame, it immediately puts a, puts a gray box around it. And if that focusing point is anywhere near that subject, I don't mean right next to it, but I mean just anywhere in proximity to it, if you start shooting, it'll just immediately jump to that subject and grab it and put a blue box around it if you're in servo. It is uncanny. And what it gives you, is the ability to get tremendous focusing performance with fast moving subjects and to maintain your composition. You all of a sudden now have total freedom in terms of moving the camera to keep the subject where you want as it moves and you can let it move left to right or whatever it might be. And that is the thing to me that really just changes the game with this camera compared to anything we've done before. Mm. Keith, I'm sure you you got to exercise that autofocus capability extensively out in Africa. I mean, I know Rudy's got the the tech end of it down. Experience, you know, you're just a guy out there in the wild taking images. What is it like that ability to just lock on, hold the focus, not have to worry about? It? I mean, Jake said it felt like he didn't he wasn't working at all. Did you have the same vibe? I know it's a different kind of subject that you're shooting out there yeah, how does it compare he had a harder subject to follow yeah. than i did <laughs> much harder let's 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 make sure we stack I that could, up properly. i could direct i could direct my subject i don't think he has that luxury <laughs> your stu- your subject was a slow 40 year old man for somebody who is not shooting slow 40 year old men on a sidewalk you said what was it, it like me. real time keith you know it's uh, just to expand on on what rudy was saying uh, i had a variety of, of scenarios where there would be you know, either a flock of birds or in one case, an illustration I'll use here is we, we had this incredible evening. I think it was evening number two. We came in, up, we were up in the Chobe River up on a boat. I mean, it's just like one of the most romantic scenes ever, right? You're on this iconic river, kind of cruising down it slowly, just looking for anything moving on the shorelines. And we came across this big sort of like troop of baboons and they were there's a lot of young ones with them and they were they were just animatedly playing you know the sun's going down everything's kind of alive you know they're kind of taking in the last warmth of the day getting water looking for food and the young ones were just they were really animatedly playing and kind of like what Rudy was saying earlier I could just point the camera over in the general direction and you might have like eight nine different little baboons and they're all really running around a lot and then every now and then one would peel off and another one would take chase after it. And you get these incredible moments with dust blowing up. And I would, all I would have to do, I mean, the camera was doing so much of the work that I wasn't having to like move, you know, move my focus point over and be like this one, I could just kind of stick in the general facility. And as soon as two would peel off and I knew there was hopefully going to be a moment, all I had to do is basically just keep up. And if I could keep up the, the eye tr- or the, the focus tracking was outrageous. I, I typically kept it on like animal eye tracking. You know, that was kind of the go-to. It made the most sense. And the photos were, I was getting pictures that I would normally have had to work much, much harder for. Like baboons jumping in the air, hitting dust and it's dust's exploding. So you're kind of like losing sight of the animal for just a brief moment, which is more than enough for a camera to stop tracking. And sure enough, they would emerge. And, I, you know, I'm just holding down the shutter button, just, brrr, just trying to get whatever I get once the moment had passed, you know, and later when you're getting to kind of review, blown away with as one would jump away, uh, the focus would lock on and the ones behind it would slowly start getting softer. And that one that was actually in the air and in motion was staying perfectly tack sharp. And it becomes really addicting when you know that your percentage for success just keeps kind of going up. It just makes you want to. It just makes you want to work a subject even longer and longer. 
And, and at first, you know, when I read, you know, 30 frames per second, I'm like, okay, I could see that being applicable in a certain scenario. But when you're shooting something like an animal that's moving really, really quick, that th there's always going to be like the precise moment, right? The moment you really, really want to get. And oftentimes that can be in the frame that you just didn't get during that blackout moment. 30 frames a second. I, yeah, I, mean, I mean, this is a camera. You yeah, look at oh, it and camera. it yeah. really, it's a professional camera. It's for the unforgiving jobs, the person who has to have everything right, every shot. It, right. you know, from in my experience, just being on set with Jake while he played around with this camera, it's like, no, there was no room for error. There was right. no like, hey, we'll we'll catch this one. Well, yeah, we didn't get this one, but close. Yeah. This is truly a close, but no cigar is not close enough. It has to be on. Um, now, did you get to exercise that eye control AF? I know Jake got uh, got to use it with, with the help of Rudy there, but Keith, did you use that at all out in the field? You know, I didn't. And the reason I didn't, it's something I actually can't wait to play with a little bit more. But because I knew I had a finite period of time, I and it, it was just myself being like, you know what, I'm going to go in and shoot how I know how to shoot. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I was, I was just so protective about not wanting to miss anything that I just mm -hmm. went in and I, I turned it off and I just wanted, I was just going to, I just stuck with animal eye control, worked the servo modes, worked all the <laughs> modes that I was very, very familiar with. And once I get my hands on it, that's going to be a different thing. Once it's, once it's like in my possession, <laughs> but, you know, this was, this was just this like gift of a loner that I got to play with for a couple of weeks. And um, so, yeah, the, the, the short answer is no, but the long answer is because I just wanted to stick to what I knew. And I really wanted to just see what that autofocus could do all on its own. And um, you know how it is, you, you kind of, at least as a photographer or even a filmer, you, you kind of find those rhythms that work for yourself. And then Absolutely. so I'm actually excited to move in further and see what eye control can do for my workflow. But for this specific shoot, I decided not to use it, which was maybe a cowardly sort of move here on my part. But you know what I mean? I was not like, at all. Percentage if I could get it. <laughs> not at all. I mean, all you had to do was do, you had to deliver the goods. Right. And, and Rudy, I mean, he backed he backed it up. Yeah. I'd like to. Absolutely. Um, I can go into that later in terms of the interviews <laughs> that Keith got. But I'd like to just piggyback on what Keith, Keith just said, because it's an important point. I think as information began to come out about this camera in the preceding months before today's announcement, uh, I think a lot of people latched on to the eye control. And I think it's important for anybody. I don't care what kind of work you do, whether you shoot portraits, whether you shoot wildlife, whether you shoot sports, you know, close up to nature, whatever. I think it's important to consider the eye control, the cherry on top. It's the icing on the cake, so to speak. Uh, it's a cool additional layer of functionality that the EOS R3 offers, but it shouldn't, in my opinion, be the first thing that, oh my God, I got my hands on this camera. Let me try the eye control. It, <laughs> understand the focusing system's goodness first, like Keith was talking about, then, you can get into calibrating the eye control, which only takes a moment, and then actually trying it and seeing if it works for you. Really yeah, I mean, I could I could speak better. to I could speak to trying it out. So like we didn't do it until the end, um, and it was a it's a calibration process is kind of fun, and then when it does work, uh, is it's very hard to describe, but it there is literally an orange circle following where your eye goes. Uh, it was a little unsettling at first, uh, <laughs> but it's definitely something that I think something you, it's a workflow you definitely i think could easily get used to um you know have more and more time with it i think i would have you know tried it out more but you know like keith said in the moment we were shooting derek outside i wanted to tr go with what i knew and uh see how the tracking uh worked on its own but it's a very like magical feature that you really have to see to believe and you can only see it looking through that viewfinder but it was effective and it, and it worked beautifully i mean i have him step into the frame in the video and then i and i i tell them you know i want to look at your arm focus point goes to his arm and then i look at his other arm which is on the other side of the frame focus point goes right to that other arm it was it was wild yeah i mean it, just seeing jake's expression i wish everyone could have seen how jake was responding to it it was it's like he didn't believe it he was seeing it but he wasn't believing it he's like i i see what it's doing but no yeah no it, yeah 
Yeah, it, it's pretty insane. Once you calibrate it, for most people, it really is the fastest way to initially position a focusing point. It's just, it's uncanny how fast it is and how quickly you can just say, I want to I want to focus over here, bingo. As soon as you tap the shutter button, a focusing point's there. Uh, and uh, it's, I don't want to, you know, dwell on it uh, too long because there's so much other goodness in this camera. And I'm sure that Keith has a lot more to expand on in terms of his experience with it. But uh, I just wanted to sort of summarize with that. Yeah, definitely. Keith, let's bring it back to you. What was, what was the standout for you on this? Was there anything um, that really shined above and beyond anything else? I know we, we talked about that impressive autofocus, but other than that was, you know, what did you like about this camera? I got to say that I, I loved the ergonomics a lot. I love the way it feels. And I mean, again, I shoot, I've traditionally been shooting with the R5 quite a bit, which is a smaller camera, but I love the feel of that, you know, having that vertical grip to just kind of throw it up and down. I know that's been around forever, but it is just feels good in the hand. But I, I, again, I had to revisit the weight. I loved the weight, but I also just, I, I loved the, the files are incredible. Wait, when people get to see the files and see what you can do with them, because, you know, right away, I'm like, okay, cutting my megapixels in half here, right? And that's kind of a, as someone who's always, we're all striving for the highest quality thing we possibly can. And I remember on the initial onboarding phone call about the R3, you know, the engineers like Andrew and all the, all the folks were telling me, they're like, look, we know this is half the megapixels as the R5. Don't worry. Wait till you see these files. And sure enough, it's stunning. The dynamic range, the way things fall off, the highlights, all those things that you want. And they, they're easily enlargeable if you do need them to go any bigger. I mean, 24 megapixels is a big file, let's, let's, let's be honest. But when you're used to working with, you know, something you open up Lightroom and you're like zooming in and, you know, a lot of that picture zooming in on this, you're like, oh, it's not zooming in as much. It doesn't matter. You can still keep, I was punching into like two and 300 just to kind of see like, okay, where are my details? The files are gorgeous. And I, 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 by after shooting with it for one day out in the field and when we're like offloading pictures that night, right away, I was like, I'm in love with this camera. And so it's, I think, I think it's kind of one of those things that you're going to want to, I mean, we talked about it earlier. This is a, this is a high performance camera. This is for high performance moving subjects. I think it's a tool, right? Depends what your subject is. So I'm, I mean, I'm going to be an R5, R3 guy. That's just the way it's going to work for me until Canon's next drop, which I'm sure will just be insane. That's going to be, that's going to be my system right now. And it depends on what I'm shooting and what I need. It, it fills a huge void. And it also gives me a lot more confidence too. Because a lot of these things, you know, you go out there on an assignment and, and again, we talked earlier about the fact that you can't really direct these things. You know, you're sort of at the mercy of, of how the, an animal is going to perform or even someone shooting sports, you're just simply there to try to distract and find that, that key moment. This is going to make your job that much easier, which we're all looking for a higher success right here when we're out shooting on a high pressure job. And so this fits that mold quite well. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you went into that on on the megapixel count, because I, I think you're right, Keith, it's gotten into like a war of like, well, we got to keep going up and up and up and up. And I think on this Canon's just like, OK, well, we can stay right here, give you a better image and it's going to do the work. It, it's no sense in having a 50 megapixel image if you're not delivering the image quality. I mean, it's really at the end of the day, it literally is megapixel count. Right. Um, it's about the, it the quality. Focus and... doesn't care how many megapixels you have. It misses focus. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Totally, that's so true. And and uh, you'll you'll be pleased. I guarantee people are going to see the when, they, when you're working with this camera. It the files are great. I would, yeah. I mean, and 24 is still big. It's so funny how I've been through this whole digital evolution, as I'm sure we all have in this room. And you know, it's remember when 12 was a big deal. You know what I mean? But then it's sort of we start getting into those high forties all of a sudden it becomes the new standard, but it's, it's, it's often not necessary, you know, like I was yeah. still able to go in and, and, you know, with birds, sometimes you can only get so close, you know, they're skittish. You're, you know, I, we had an 800 out there. We had a 600, we had 400 to eight, but we had a variety of super telephotos that we could lean on depending on what we needed. But sometimes even that isn't enough. You're working with a small bird. It's only going to allot you to getting so close before it's just like, no, I'm not having it. So there is times where you are going to need to crop in a little bit. It's just inevitable, depending on how you want that photo to feel. 
and the camera took any, you know, I wasn't doing like extreme crops. I don't like to do that just personally for myself, but I don't mind shaving off a third if I have to. The files are killer. It's perfectly there. Definitely. Now, now, Rudy, we did have a question come in from Mark on YouTube asking if there is any pixel shift capability in the, the R3. No, there isn't. Uh, okay. That was something we don't have in this camera. We obviously have image stabilization, which of course is the same, but totally different. Uh, but no pixel shift capability to give us larger files with more effective megapixels. Okay. Now let, let's stick with that stabilization. If I'm correct here, when, when paired with the right RF lens up to eight stops? Right. That's based on standardized SEPA compliant tests. Uh, you know, as the, they used to say back when I was a kid for car ads, your mileage may vary. Uh, but <laughs> depending on the lens, you can get up to eight stops of shake correction uh, in still images. And when we do that with, when we do, do those tests with zoom lenses, it's always at the telephoto setting. So with a 24 to 105, it's going to be at 105 millimeters. With a 100 to 400, it's going to be at 400 millimeters and so on. Yeah, Keith, that's exactly where my mind went was telephoto. I mean, you said you were shooting 600 millimeters. As anybody who has shot at that telephoto range, you know that it's not as easy as just holding up. You make it look easy. You make it look so glamorous in the, the videos, but it's like, no, you get out there and you do it yourself. And I'm like, why are all my images blurry? I thought Keith does it. <laughs> uh, is that is that a, a small added benefit? I mean, look, I'm, I'm sure a majority of your work, Keith, was shot on non-stabilized bodies, but now having this technology where we can stabilize up to that point, it's got to got to be some kind of a benefit. It's game changer. No question about it. And not, not to mention some of those, you know, sometimes twilight's the best time of day. You're getting really nice bounce light and you don't want to crank the ISO up to 25,000. I certainly don't. And if I know that I'm working with the subject that, it, that I don't necessarily need, you know, a thousandth of a second or more, you know, I, I shot a, a, a few owls that, were, you know, I think I was shooting at probably like one twenty-fifth of a second, just handheld. You no. Know, and having stabilization in both the lens and the body, I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Not to mention, it's funny too, when you, when you really want to test it, I remember at one point I, I picked up the camera and I had bumped off the image stabilization on the lens just on accident. I picked it up and I'm still like, it was, it was still working great. Shot some photos. Cause you know, the body is still doing its work. And then I later noticed, I'm like, oh man, the lens is also off. <laughs> pop that thing back on. And it's crazy how, I mean, a lot, you take your world at 600 and you just kind of narrow it down to this. It doesn't take much to just be oscillating and, you know, and everything all of a sudden is chaos. The, it's, it's amazing how solid the dual of the image stabilization between the camera and the lens. It's crazy. It's like you're on a tripod. And again, when you're holding a big lens, even though I was commenting about how light it is, it doesn't take long before something does inevitably get heavy, you know, and you're finding yourself in weird positions where your elbows are like jammed up in your chest, right? It's <laughs> the weight of what, you know, cause you're like, you're like, come on bird, take off already, man. And like you're just sitting there kind of waiting for the moment. Cause you know, I'm out there hoping to not get like an identification photo, but something with a little bit of energy in there, which constitutes a lot of patience and a lot of sitting in the sun sort of waiting. And, um, Thank God, though, the camera is just locked on and it's stable, even if I'm just like breathing heavy and starting to kind of gas out, you know, so uh, I lean into that real heavily. I was just grateful for it. And I mean, eight stops is insane. You know, it's, it's oh, totally you're almost on a tripod, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for somebody me, like me who shaky hands and no matter what time of day I'm shooting, I probably already had three or four cups of coffee. Yeah, totally. Me. Too much caffeine. This is it adds Definitely. Up, you know? <laughs> Definitely. Now I want to transition over to the video side, Jake, you, you love you some video. So let's talk a little bit. I, you know, we'll mix in Rudy. We could throw some specs in. So Rudy, you want to lay the groundwork here as far as the video capabilities. What are we looking at? What are the big sticking points on the video of the R3? Well, the 24 million pixel sensor means that if we're recording with the full width of the sensor for video now, we're looking at 6K input. And when you record raw video with this, there's both raw and a raw light setting, which is a smaller uh, file uh, that is smaller in terms of actual file size, not in terms of number of pixels. You're talking a 6K raw image, and that is a great foundation to get tremendous detail in raw video. Raw video is, you know, a, a definite process in terms of, you know, actually, you know, working with it uh, in post. 
And many people are gonna prefer the simplicity of just going to 4K or even full HD. 4K at your 24 frames a second, your uh, 30 frames a second, uh, and your 60 frames a second is using 6K original input and then oversampling it down to 4K. So by definition, you know you're getting even more detailed than you would be normally. Uh, we also have 4K at 120 frames a second, the high frame rate 4K uh, for slow motion type of work. Uh, and that is the only one that is not oversampled from 6K. That is a 4K original grab uh, from the 24 million pixel sensor. Uh, but it, the video quality on this camera is excellent. And like I say, for shooting 4K, unlike with the R5, and I'm certainly not knocking the R5, don't get me wrong, uh, but unlike the R5, we don't have to pick a separate menu setting of high quality video recording to get that oversampled 4K. So like I say, you can just set it for any 4K setting other than the high frame rate, 120 frames a second. And you've got oversampled 4K. It's going to be sharp. Hmm. Jake, and did you, you play got a lot of auto, the video? Uh, almost all the autofocusing goodness as well. Jake, yeah, how I mean, much it, video did you uh, dig in? I mean, not as much as I would have liked. Uh, you know, we did, we did, uh, we did shoot this in the middle of a hurricane that was coming over New York City, so we were limited in our availability to go outside. So, you know, we did shoot a little bit of video in the studio, um, testing all the different varieties of codecs. Uh, we did 4K LI. Uh, we did uh, we test the two color spaces. You have HDR PQ. Uh, as well as C log three. And then the nice touch about those is that it actually takes you out of eight bit and puts you into 10 bit mode, which I thought was a nice uh, touch. Um, that way um, you don't accidentally uh, shoot log in an eight bit. Cause I've done that before and it's very hard to recover. <laughs> um, so that's great that, you know, that, that takes it, uh, that eliminates that mistake happening. So um, yeah, I mean, a great variety. I think this would be like a great, you know, phenomenal B camera for any, uh, you know, interview or um a narrative documentary kind of stuff i mean the 6k raw is just i mean that's that's pretty nuts in a camera like this that's already at the high mission what i, I like to use the phrase mission critical photo camera um to have 6k raw uh as well in internal is uh is very attractive very appealing um i think yeah like in terms of use case i, I you know 4k is Totally fine, totally passable. 4K all eye up to 60 frames per second. And then, you know, going into uh, having the 4K 120 is great uh, as well for those certain moments that you may need. If you want to slow something really, slow something really down. Um, yeah, and the 6K RAW was there. You know, it's RAW is the best way to shoot to get the most uh, dynamic range and, and, and RAW data to really manipulate to create the image and the artistry that you're looking for. So. Yeah, I wish I could have shot more, but I wish I was in Africa shooting 6K raw, but I didn't get an opportunity. <laughs> Jake, next time, let's do it. Next this. time, let's do it. All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> Pete, did you get to shoot any video over there? You just stuck the stills? I did shoot some. Um, I was mostly shooting in 4K 120, um, okay. you know, I because I was hand-holding most of it. I wasn't yeah. working on a tripod, so I was I was just kind of hedging my bets. But I got I got one shot that I love. It's a it's a herd of impala. And as they were coming in towards this water hole, you've got a few of the, you know, the bulls in the background that are essentially like driving the entire herd. And you never know when it's going to happen, but often when they get within a certain range of it, they often start running towards the water. And I'm not sure, I'm not a biologist, so I'm not sure what exactly the reason for that is. If it's, if they make sure the coast is clear and then they're just like, let's get in and let's get out. I don't know. But I got this shot of, it has to be, I don't know, a hundred Impala just just running straight into camera dust coming off their hooves and and it was incredible that the autofocus performance is moving straight over into video as well and it i wish i could just share the shot right now it was one of the shots one of the video clips that i was the most happy with and it was random too it was one of those moments and i think that a lot of people that are tuned in right now can relate with this when you're out there and your whole objective is really still photography but you're like i gotta get a couple video clips you're sort of torn because you're like, I'm missing still moments. And then oftentimes when you're shooting stills, you're like, I'm missing some really great video clips right now. I took a chance and I was like, I'm going to roll on this right here. I also got a great shot of a baboon, like just basically like WWF wrestling onto another one, just this huge jump. And uh, I, so I played with it a little bit. 
and and I, I had no complaints. Every time I would switch over to video mode, I was the only the only thing I was sad about is I didn't get still photos. You know, it was that classic sort of conflict thing. But no, man, it, the, the files are fantastic. I, yeah. I think you just described every single person watching right now that has to <laughs> fight that at some time or another. Even if we're not over there in Africa, it's like, yeah, you, you're torn between the, the video internal, and still internal conflict. Yeah, do I? Yeah, yeah. Totally. What does they say? The mark of a good compromise is when both parties are equally dissatisfied. That's kind of the it's kind of the feeling you get. Right? Like, <laughs> love the photo. Yeah. I wish I had the video. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That definitely sounds about it. Now, can we talk a little bit about, uh, we had some questions come in about recordings, come in about recording limits, um, heat dissipation. I know there was a couple different modes for, for the overheating, for controlling that. Can you talk a little bit about that, Rudy? Sure. Yeah. Let's get right into it. First off, there is no more 29 minute, 59 second time recording limit on this camera per file size, or per, per file that is. Uh, up until now, every camera we've made for legal reasons, really, uh, has had a limit where no matter how small your video file was, if you recorded for 29 minutes, 59 seconds, it stopped. You could start it right back up again and start a new file, but you had to be there to start it up. This camera does not have the 29 minute, 59 second record limit, period. Uh, it actually, it's, there is a limit. It's now six hours <laughs> in that regard. Oof. As far as heat buildup is concerned, the camera does have sensors in the camera to measure internal buildup of heat around the processor and sensor and you know, critical areas there. And it also has the ability to read the temperature of the exterior of your memory cards. Now, that's important because wow. CF Express cards, when you start force feeding them a lot of information, they can get really hot. That's a price you pay for their incredible performance. So we have a, set, a setting in the menu when you're recording video uh, in the red shooting area called auto power off temperature. There's a standard setting, which means that the camera is reading internal temperature and the card surface. And there's a high setting, meaning you're telling the camera allow more, into, allow more heat. And basically what it does is it doesn't read the card temperature anymore. It says we're only going to look at internal heat in the camera. Cards are on their own. So you are able to record longer. Now, that said, if you record 4K, these are according to Canon Inc. tests taken at 73 degrees Fahrenheit at room temperature in test conditions that can be repeated. At 4K, 30P, there is no heat limit. You can just keep right on recording. At 4K, 60P, you're talking... 60 plus minutes before the camera will step in and shut down. And I'm talking 60 plus continuous recording minutes, like as if you were recording a press conference or something like that. For raw recording, which is extremely processor intensive, there you have at the standard setting, a 25 minute time limit, approximately 25 minutes. Uh, before the camera is going to step in and say, okay, we got to stop and cool it, as they used to say back when I was a kid. Uh, or if you set the auto, the auto power off temperature to high with raw, you can get 60 plus minutes of continuous recording before once again, the camera steps in and says, okay, that's it. We got to, you know, we got to cool off. And I, all these numbers I'm giving you are continuous recording. You know, it's, you know, most of us aren't shooting press conferences all the time. So the likelihood that, you know, every clip you make is going to be 30 to 60 continuous minutes. It depends on the kind of work you do. But for many of us, that's not going to be the case. And you certainly uh, can get longer total times if you just, you know, turn the camera off for a few moments in between takes and that kind of thing. Finally, the other really processor intensive setting for video in terms of heat is your 4K high frame rate, 120 frames a second in 4K. For that, you can do up to 12 continuous minutes uninterrupted. And at that point, there's enough heat build up that the camera under test conditions will say, hey, we, we got to cool it here. Keep in mind, playing that back at normal 30 frames a second speeds, that's 48 minutes of recording. Although in terms of what the camera is literally recorded live, it's 12 minutes. 
So those are the reporting times that you have according to candidate tests. We're being very transparent and upfront about that. These, these results are in the spec sheets that are on the Canon website. Uh, and they were you know, part of the announcement that we made earlier today. Uh, this camera clearly has steps taken within it. Given the fact that it's weather sealed, it doesn't have vents or anything. No, it does not have a cooling fan in it or whatever. Uh, but steps have been taken to do everything we can to dissipate and manage heat internally in the camera to a, protect the camera from damage and to extend recording times as much as possible. Gosh, Rudy, I want to be like you when I grow up. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> I Man. have a cheat sheet, I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a question come in, Rudy, from Joe joining us on YouTube, asking about the low-pass filter. Is it the same as the 1DX Mark III? That's a good question. That's a very astute question. Um, the 1DX Mark III had an extremely sophisticated low-pass filter that instead of breaking the image into two separate rays, two pixels worth of information for each single ray coming in, so to speak. Uh, it broke it into 16 uh, and was still able to get great sharpness out of it. It was a tremendous feat in terms of just the engineering that went into it. The short answer to your question though is no. On the R3, it does not have that extremely sophisticated low pass filter. It does have a new low pass filter that is tuned specifically to this 24 million pixel sensor. Uh, and, you know, Canon has never produced a camera to date with no low pass filtration. I know the 5DSR basically canceled the effect of low pass filtration, but it's still uh, in effect, it still had a low pass filter. Uh, this does as well. And we've always felt that the risks of not having a low pass filter are greater in terms of their potential negative impact than the benefits in terms of slightly greater sharpness out of the box without having to run an unsharp mask and processing and that kind of thing. Okay. Now, now Rudy, I want to throw another question to you. You had some questions uh, regarding use, the use of EF lenses. So for people who are using EF lenses, what can they expect uh, to the, the difference to be between EF, RF? Is it as simple as we think, or does it go a little deeper? One of the beautiful things about the EOS R system from the beginning, from the launch of the first EOS R camera in 2018, was that ability to almost seamlessly attach EF and even EFS lenses with an adapter uh, and still get, you know, all your autofocus and, you know, all that good stuff. Now, as we've gotten into extremely high speed cameras, you know, in this case, 30 frames a second maximum shooting speed with the electronic shutter, some of the RF, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Every RF lens will support 30 frames a second as long as you're working at a fast enough shutter speed. EF, recent EF lenses. And if you think about when lenses were introduced initially into the marketplace, lenses like, I'm just throwing a couple out for it as an example, the 70, to, the EF, 70 to 200 F 2.8 L version three uh, IS lens. Lenses like the 24 to 70 F 2.8 version three. The, the newer EF lenses will have no problem with the, maintaining 30 frames a second operation with the adapter with the R3. Older EF lenses that have been in the lineup for a longer period of time don't have the same communication capabilities. And as a result, the camera has to slow down. You won't hurt anything by putting it at 30, at a continuous high plus setting, which would normally be 30 frames a second. But you're going to find with older adapted EF lenses that you're getting closer to about 20 frames a second, give or take, maximum. Okay. Thank you for that, that breakdown. Uh, Keith, we had a question come in. Simple question for you, electronic shutter or mechanical shutter? What's your go-to and what did you use out there in Africa? You know, first off, I just wish I could like matrix Rudy's brain like into the back of mine, you know, get that <laughs> tech data. That's a scary thought. That's a scary you're gonna, thought. You're, you're not the only one. It. You're not the only one. <laughs> Rudy's like, it's a curse. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I mostly was shooting on electronic. I, I, I just didn't want the sound of the shutter. You know, there were times where I would, I would, I was going to the mechanical, but um, a lot of times I was, uh, you know, I was on mechanical when I needed it, but I was shooting electronic when I needed things to be a little quieter, depending on the situation. If it was bigger megafauna like lions and elephants and even baboons, it didn't matter. But when you're dealing with something like a bee eater or a really tiny bird that might be a little bit skittish. Uh, and oftentimes we were rolling cameras on the side as well. I usually would just, you know, I like to work in a silent shutter 
which was on the electronic side of things. So um, I would say it was on or off. Sometimes you just wanted to hear that purr too. It's nice to have that indicator too. And also what I did like about the R3 is it doesn't have, a, the shutter isn't loud, which is a big deal, especially if you're working on something that sometimes that is enough of an audio, you know, audible cue for something to actually like, but even with people just to change their cadence if they know that there's a camera on them. So I don't know. I kind of danced in and out, but I probably leaned it to electronic a bit more. If I can okay. just throw this in, in addition to uh, what, Keith, what Keith just said, this is the first camera that we've made, the first mirrorless camera, where electronic shutter is intended as the standard means of operation. With every camera we've had up to now, we've had electronic slash silent shutter capability, but it's always come with some compromises. You can't use flash. There's a risk of rolling shutter distortion in some situations, depending on your shutter speed and subject movement and that kind of thing. Those were sufficiently taken care of with the stacked sensor technology and the faster readout speeds, uh, along with the blackout free viewing and electronic shutter, which is another nice thing, that when you take this camera out of the box, it's set for servo autofocus, fast uh, drive speeds, and electronic shutter operation. Users are obviously free, as Keith just mentioned, to convert over to mechanical shutter or first curtain electronic shutter anytime they desire. You just go into the menu and do it. I'm, I'm glad you went into that, Rudy, because we did have some questions out there coming in from YouTube regarding things like banding and warping of the image when shooting with the electronic shutter. Now, is that something where with that readout speed, it has to be at a certain shutter speed or how, how does that get affected? Those kind of things generally happen the faster our shutter speeds are. And to some degree, I mean, you start photographing helicopter rotor blades. I mean, you can even run into it with a totally mechanical shutter to a degree, uh, but it tends to be much more prone. Uh, I should say electronic shutter is much more prone to that. Okay, that being said, you tend to get it more at faster shutter speeds. Now, how does this camera perform? Certainly compared to anything we've had up to this time, it's a significant improvement. Yeah, I don't care if you're talking about those traditional golf swings that we see and, you know, uh, the side-by-side -side shots or whatever, uh, birds in flight where, you know, the, with the, wing, the tips of the wings and stuff, uh, there is no question that there is dramatically reduced rolling shutter effect in this camera than we've had previously. I'm not saying there's none, but it's the likelihood that you're going to run into it is a lot less than any uh, full-frame mirrorless camera we've had up to this point. Uh, can we talk a little bit about customization of the camera? I know Canon's always been super user-friendly, just the interface. It's, I, I always feel like Canon's that camera you can pick up, and if you've never picked up a camera before, you can figure it right out. Um, can you talk a little bit about the interface on this, if you can compare it to a familiar uh, model we would know? I, I've heard R5 meets 1DX Mark III with kind of the layout and look of this camera, but as far as the, the setup and customization, can we talk about that a little bit? It's Yeah, really. It, it, that's a great point. Our engineers, for the most part, if you look at the evolution of our camera lines, digital SLR and then into mirrorless, uh, for the most part, they've done an excellent job of maintaining that Canon continuity, for lack of a better phrase, that sort of Canon basic layout, the quick control dial on the back face of the camera, uh, the, you know, the, the operation angle and just the feel of things like the shutter button, grip design, and that kind of thing. These are things that our engineers do real well. Ergonomics, obviously, are a personal taste kind of thing. And, you know, one size does not fit everybody, but, you know, I think it's fair that over time, you can certainly look at the R5 and the R6 and say this, and I think we've done it again here with a bigger camera, uh, that they've done a brilliant job. In terms of customization, there are 12 controls on the camera that have the ability, 12 buttons that you can go in and customize, and there are dials that can be customized as well. They have expanded. We already had a pretty good range of customization with the R5 and the R6 cameras. Uh, but they have really expanded that. There were some of these buttons have as many as 70 different options you can commit to them. Uh, not every single customizable button, but some of them. So uh, there are a lot of cool things that you can do to just, if, if you think of something, one of the many, many, many features in the camera that you're saying, hey, this really floats my boat. I'd love to be able to just have access to this 
I'm not going to need it all the time, but it'd be great to be able to just turn it on quickly when I need it and then go back to not using it when I don't need it anymore. I can't say you can do that for every single thing in the camera, but you can do it for more of them than on any camera we've had up to this point. Hmm. Jake, Keith, Jake, I know you get your hands on a lot of cameras, a lot of different brands all over the place. What's it like? I mean, you, you, you get that. I, I kind of feel like you could pick up a, any camera, uh, any Canon camera in the last 10 years. And it's, it's all, it's right there. It's, it's a very familiar layout. What say you, Mr. Estes? Very familiar. Yeah. Very familiar layout. Um, I, I, you know, I think Keith mentioned this earlier in terms of the ergonomic feel. I mean, it is deceptively light. You pick it up and you're like, Whoa, wait a minute. This is not it's supposed to be heavier. Right. Um, it's incredibly lightweight and the, it just, felt great. I don't get to demo a lot of dual grip cameras like that. So I hadn't, I hadn't held one of those in a while. And, uh, man, I wish all cameras were made like that. Cause just going, cause you know, we shoot, I think most of the things I shot of you, Derek was portrait. So I was always holding the camera like this and it was just such a comfortable, you know, position. And because the, I didn't have to work that hard. Like I could have shot all day if it didn't start raining, you know, and these guys had to go home. So like, I would have, I would have took you all over the city and made you jump off of a lot of things <laughs> just to keep shooting with that camera. That's how much fun I was, I was having using it because uh, the image quality is great. Performance is phenomenal. It's like when you get a tool like that, that is mission critical designed for professional use, you know, you want to go use it as much as possible um, and just come back with a, a bunch of amazing images. And I felt like we did that. And Ken O'Neill's three high quality stuff. I, I think if I remember correctly, Jake shoots so few cameras now that have that that dual grip that oh yeah. He was turning and then he's like, Oh wait, hold on, I forgot. Like I have the grip right, I got the vertical grip on it right there. Yeah, it was like, I forgot that I yeah, I had to like relearn. Turn I was like, oh wait, there's a grip here. Oh, I can hold it this way so comfortably. Yeah. Yes. Cause I'm so used to using much smaller. Uh, body cameras that this was a real pleasant surprise i can just yeah. jump in real quick because those are all great points one of the things that kind of may risk getting lost in the shuffle and i understand that our viewers for the most part and i'm sure virtually all of them have not had a chance to see this camera live yet or touch it and handle it and we're talking now about the handling and the overall comfort and that kind of thing. And again, it's subjective, but it's it really seems to check all the boxes for most users. But there's a couple of things I just want to throw in in addition. One is the responsiveness of this camera, not only at the shutter button, but everywhere else in terms of the, the touchscreen interface. Uh, when you push a button on the back of the camera, when you turn a dial, it's... <sighs> If I use the phrase real time, it obviously is a little bit of a misnomer there, but it is just so responsive to what you are trying to do. It just responds and reacts so quickly. And with that, I want to emphasize, I want to underscore that particularly with that electronic shutter, you are not committed to 30 frame a second operation. We understand life doesn't always exist at 30 frames a second for every situation. You can, with the continuous drive with electronic shutter, you can slow it down to 15 frames a second or three continuous frames a second, or you can just shoot single shots, single shot mode. So yeah. understand that you're not locked into 30 frames a second if you're using the electronic shutter. And that responsiveness that I talked about, even if you were shooting portraits or whatever, with single frame operation, that responsiveness never leaves the R3 shooting experience. It's uncanny. Mm -hmm. I can, yes i can attest to that yep. Keith, it, how it do you works follow as fast that? as my brain yeah <laughs> <laughs> how do I, follow I, I was gonna ask for your parting words keith and now i'm like we're gonna have to cut rudy's mic off he's making us look bad i know man exactly i'm, learning. <laughs> I'm sitting here learning i'm like oh all right that's a good point yeah <laughs> i don't really know how to follow that at all all i just um I had a pretty glowing trip with this camera. I mean, we didn't, I, you know, it's, I didn't have any hiccups. There wasn't anything that I, that I, I had to overtly like really try to learn. I just showed up and the whole intent was to just put this camera through its paces and make it work. And honestly, it wasn't one of those things where you're sitting there like, you know, after, after your encounter happens and you're sitting there complaining or digging through menus, trying to fix things, it just worked. And 
that's all you want if you're out on, a, on an assignment. You just want your stuff to not only work, but to perform at the highest level so it's not debilitating your creativity because at the end of the day, you're out there trying to execute some creativity. And, and uh, I didn't have a single complaint with the camera other than I couldn't just keep the one they sent me. That would be the primary <laughs> complaint. But <laughs> yeah, they, didn't, they didn't let me keep it either. Yeah, what's up with that, man? We need, you know, we need to write. We need to write more emails and complain more. It's a good problem. <laughs> a little canon swag bag at the end of the at the end of the trip. I wouldn't hate it. I wouldn't hate it. I'll give you no, my address, look, Rudy. There you go. Look, I, I'll say this. I I don't think I've ever seen Jake respond like that, Rudy. I I'll go out on a limb and say I think Jake had a crush on the camera. <laughs> I was. I mean, that's why I put. I try to put that little blooper in at the end there to sort of show like how genuinely uh, happy I was enjoying it. It was it was a lot of fun and yeah. Highly, highly recommend. It is it is it is the quintessential professional camera tool. There you go. Like the kids say, I wish somebody would look at me the same way Jake Estes looked at that. <laughs> but look, this has been a blast. I can't believe an hour's up already. Um, you know, this whew, I could go all day with you guys, and we didn't even we didn't even cover everything. So I I implore everybody out there watching. Please do, do go look into this camera. Jace got a video up on YouTube. We got an article on the B&H Explorer site. Um, definitely check out Keith's video. Keep a box of tissues right next to you, especially if you are a parent. And Rudy, you're, you're a national treasure, Rudy. We, we got to have you on more. We got to just make like a, a monthly. Thank, thank you so much. Give Rudy his own Wait show at this point. <laughs> hey, Ru- take my mic. Take my I'd watch here. it. I'd watch it. There we go. But no, um, definitely... Keith, you made it easy for us. Ledzinski.com, Ledzinski on Instagram. If you guys are not following him, Keith has those kind of images where you look at them and you're just like, I give up. Take my cameras. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. Super humble guy. Um, Jake, where can we find you on Instagram? Oh, uh, it's my name, Jake Estes underscore shoots. Uh, it's on my Instagram. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'll see me on the YouTube channel. Um, my, you'll see my face around that uh youtube channel every every now and then so you know where to find me and then he's the face of the channel he's so shy humble uh just look for the look for the glowing beard but that's all we have for now rudy jake keith it's been a blast ken and i want to thank you guys for sponsoring this event wonderful camera you can go check it out uh when it becomes available uh, get in the store at b and h get your hands on some gear check everything out uh, if you guys do have any questions phone lines are open the internet is working Go do your thing. But that's all we have now for this special edition of the BNH Virtual Event Space Canon EOS R3 edition. Huge thank you to all of our viewers and to our expert panel here. That's it for me. Catch y'all next time. Thanks so much, folks. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.